My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back to the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, for this latest episode. Having a good time here on uh, almost at spring break again. I've been saying that this entire time. It's actually fall break for seminary right now, so I'm enjoying that, and hopefully... As uh, next week goes on, I'll actually have the time to go down to Chicago and go see my beloved brother and sister-in-law. And of course, more beloved than them is my precious niece, Malin. Really looking forward to that. Uh, Things are lining up that I'll be able to go there. Really looking forward to it. But as far as this is concerned, we're going to be going into Romans 12. And I'm so glad I decided to slow down for this one because there is a lot to unpack here. We're just going to start off with the first two verses, though. Uh, Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul brings up here, because of the immense mercies and love offered to God that he had spoken of in previous chapters, Paul reminds his readers that this is something that should spur them on to then show their gratitude for those gifts by living in a godly manner. And the very same is true of us. Like we have been purchased at an immense personal cost to God And if we live our lives as if this truth is not reality, then we distort the message of Jesus, excuse me, message of Jesus, and make a mockery of his sacrifice. God expects better from us and is righteous to demand better of us because of what he has done on our behalf. You know, as opposed to the sacrifices of old, wherein an animal would be slaughtered to cover the sins of the people, we are now seen as a living sacrifice. To God, whose souls cannot die no matter what happens to us. We need to be reminded of this fact so that when the things of this world seek to tempt us and take us away from God, we can resist them better, knowing that our lives are proof of the sacrifice done for us and that we live out as a result of. This requires us to put some work and effort into figuring out what exactly it means to seek out the will of God which has caused as many problems as it has successes, because unfortunately, as we've covered many a time here, people are flawed and short-sighted. Listen, like you and I, we're going to make the wrong call one day down the line, thinking we're being righteous. Some of us, and I mean us, have made those wrong calls more than once, several times, more times than I want to admit. But take hope in the fact that there is always forgiveness and a new chance to make up for the past decisions we've made. Our job is not to be changed by this world into who we used to be, but to live within it and focusing instead on the word of God, which is antithetical to everything this world believes in. Next up, we're going through verses three through eight. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, before we get into the spiritual gifts, let's focus on the first part of this passage. Pride is a sin every Christian experiences at some point in time in their walks. It is There's not a single one of us out there who are immune to it. And I say that because some people like me 
it's an everyday occurrence that I have been training to fight for quite some time, and even at times managing to overcome it for a time. My family, for the most part, is filled with pig-headed egotists who are always convinced we're the smartest person in the room. Sometimes that's true, and we let that go to our head when we should be grateful that we have a great gift of intelligence and wisdom and should be using it better. It is so easy to fall in this terrible thought process that, oh, you know, since I'm so spiritually smart now or since I'm so better than everyone else because I've been saved, you know, I am now somehow inherently just superior to those who don't know God or have just come to faith. Oh, you little children, like, of course, you need my guidance. I just I just know more than you. I'm just so spiritually mature. And that could even be true. But by acting in that manner, you're negating all the stuff you learned beforehand. Whether you've known Christ as your savior, that is say, <laughs> <laughs> that was a little Southern there. Uh, as your savior for eight days, eight months, or 80 years, you are not better than anyone simply because you said yes to him. You and I said yes to him, we're saved. If you didn't, you're not. And we need to talk about that. But if we are saved, we cannot have that taken away from us. But we are still flawed human beings fighting against our baser natures. And we know the truth of the matter rather than those who delude themselves into thinking that they can earn their way to heaven or have no need of it. But then we blind ourselves to that other truth that says, oh, I need to be dependent on God. He's the only one who's given me what, given me what I have and say, no, no, I got that on my own. I did well. And we missed the point of everything that we're supposed to be learning how not to be again. And Paul also furthers this point. By bringing up how diverse a church should be within its walls, as far as the gifts that God has given us are distributed, a good church should have a blessed multitude of people with varied gifts and abilities that work together to find out how they can best benefit the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not referring multitude is in numbers, as in within that church, the multitude there should be using their gifts learning more about how God made them and wired them so that that church can be done and run more effectively. They can look after the people within the church who need help. They can look after the homeless in the area that need help or the missionaries that need money to help fund their journeys across the entire globe. That all gets done a lot better if that church is working together with their different gifts and abilities to make things run smoothly. And there's not a single one of them who is more important than the other, not even the pastor or, you know, the first person who showed up at that church that's still there or the person in charge of the finances. Not a single one of them is higher than the other. We all have different roles to fill within that church. The church needs to have organizers and evangelists just as much as they need preachers and teachers all serve an important part there in that church that can never be viewed as superior or inferior to another simply because one person is really great at offering mercy or another is more generous. Like, both of those are good things. Neither is higher than the other. If you have given yourself to Jesus Christ, then you have a spiritual gift, and you need to utilize it for His glory. It may take some time to figure out what it is, but that's okay. Like, he's I don't really think he's out there saying, all right, or you said yes, now it's time to figure it all out tomorrow or right now. It's like, no, nope. God is gracious and kind and merciful and patient. So he's going to give you time. But if we don't seek it out, he is going to prod us along that way, whether we're kicking and screaming or doing our job. So if you don't know what it is, that's okay. Volunteer in the church and find out where you don't fit and where you do. Now, failure is something we go, well, I, I, I really wanted to be part of the service team. I really wanted to be part of the, the organization or the greeters or what have you. It just didn't fit. Well, failure isn't bad in this context. It simply means that you've figured out where you're not supposed to be rather than enforcing it or even worse, not doing anything at all. Like, look, 
uh, as I'm going to get into a little bit but later, one of my spiritual gifts is teaching. And I learned there are places where I can teach more effectively than others in the church. Like I love children. I love working with them. I can't teach children past a certain uh, before a certain age because it annoys me all the repetition I have to do. And I love them. I know their minds aren't built for that yet, but like it's still, I can't teach them as effectively as I want to because I let that get in the way of me teaching. So a better place for me to be is not teaching smaller children. It's teaching, you know, fifth grade and above. Not to say that there's no repetition in there. There are plenty of people I have to repeat myself to, but it's not in the same way. I have learned I'm more effective here than when I try to seek this out there. I have learned I'm never going to be a greeter or in charge of organizing anything because if you know if it doesn't involve organizing the context of contents of a novel or an outline i am completely and utterly worthless you do not want me to be the person that say christian hey we're planning this trip well actually you know what you do it say no that trip's not going to happen because i'm garbage at it or it's not going to happen as well as you expect it to do learn where you're not good at so you can figure out where you are good at and then embrace it. There is not a single gift I'm about to list in a little bit that isn't worth being in the church. You're worth being in the church and the gifts God has given you are worth their weight in gold. Now, these are not all the gifts and we're going to get to those in a second because in these verses, Paul that we uh, read in Romans specifically mentions seven. But that's obviously not all of them. We have to get to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 10, and Ephesians 4, 11 in a bit. We're to start in Corinthians in the NIV, where we see, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Likewise, we see in Ephesians 4.11, this comes from the World English Bible. I think that's the first time I've ever used that one. I was curious to see how it would go, uh, where it says, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some shepherds and teachers. That's a lot of things. So we're going to list them off one by one in no particular order. Like I said, this is not my ranking system for how great these spiritual gifts are, because if I and my pride were in charge, it'd be my two and then everyone else's. That's not how this works. So this is just a random assortment. And we start with apostles. And this is one, a bit of a doozy to bring up, like, because there's a lot of debate about what this means or if this gift even exists anymore. Um, I believe it's the Catholic Church that still believes uh, uh, heavily in this one and some of the things we want to talk about later. But I know in a lot of Protestant churches, they think it's died off or something like that. We'll see where we land in a second. So by the strictest definition in Christianity, apostles are those chosen and sent out by Jesus himself personally to spread the gospel. That is why Paul is, is an apostle. Peter is an apostle. James is an apostle, so on and so forth. They were personally taught by him and sent out in his name to deliver the gospel. That's the strictest definition of the word. However, there have been attempts especially more recently, uh, to make this word mean church planter or missionary. And like, I see nothing inherently wrong with doing so, but like, there's that part of me. It's like, ah, well, I want to go with the stricter definition. So I, I would caution those who do so to be careful with their words. Not because I think, oh, this is what's going to unravel the church because no, I think if we don't have as strict a definition, sometimes we need to be careful with how we just throw words around. But at the end of the day, because this is written in Scripture, we know it exists. However, our interpretations of it may vary. It doesn't matter. It exists. And part of this 
journey in life is figuring out, okay, what does that actually mean? And you may come to a very different answer than me. And when it comes to something like this, something a little smaller, that's not, you know, hinging on actual belief in God, like, it's okay to have a differing opinion. Like, I think it probably still does. I just don't really know the answer to it. I'm going to have to pull, you know, a dummy for theology there. Uh, Joshua Knoll, great work that he does, as infuriating as it gets all the time, you know, say, hey, here's the thing. I don't know what I think, but here's the thing. <laughs> Next up on our docket, we have prophecy. Now, prophets, excuse me, prophets are those gifted by God with warnings of the future or who can likewise encourage the brethren with uh, promises of God's coming kindness. Now, there are some who believe this gift also doesn't exist anymore. You've got your cessationists who are very big on all the spiritual gifts are gone completely. Some cessationists say, no, it's more to fantastical ones like miracles and healing that are just gone. And we still have, you know, uh, the gift of, you know, uh, mercy and uh, administration, so on and so forth. And yeah, they don't think it exists anymore. I heartily disagree with this assertion. I am not a cessationist by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, in my personal opinion, I think it's because this is coming from a very Western point of view. And from all the missionaries that I've heard stories from and talked to along the way that have gone to Africa and Asia uh, and other regions of the world where, you know, we're not as tuned into technology or whatever is one of the reasons they offer is why this may be a thing. Like they're seeing things every day on the front lines there. Let's say cessationism. If you think this, you, you're just not there in the trenches. So obviously I haven't been there myself and these are people that I trust. So I'm going to go along with them more. And I don't see a reason for why God would suddenly stop allowing miracles to be in the world or to have people who can do those miracles. So that's more of a personal thing. And I know, once again, this is an issue in and of itself that doesn't necessarily have to break a church apart. Like, we can go to the same church on this one and disagree on this issue. When it comes to prophecies, they are meant to warn or encourage the listener and, uh, excuse me, and God can just as easily do that now as he did when the Holy Spirit was given to believers for the first time. So when does the gift of prophecy happen? Well, in my opinion, it's whenever God wants it to. That may sound like a cop-out to someone, and that's fine, but that's what I think. I think it still exists out there. I know of people, they've had dreams, and it came to pass. They went very Joseph with it. Like, there's no natural explanation for that of dreaming of things that haven't happened yet, for good or ill. God can do whatever he wants. Next up, we have a lot of things spliced together. We have shepherds, teachers, pastors, as well as the gift of words of knowledge. Now, I'll explain why all these are kind of packed together in a second. And simply put, teaching is the ability to help uh, in a biblical context. Teaching is the ability to help exposit on the Bible and explain it in a way for others to understand it better. This gift is sometimes divided into these four groups. Sometimes people cut off words of knowledge, make it its own thing. Some people add it on. For the sake of simplicity, I put them all together. Uh, to go to these different ones, shepherds typically are seen as those who oversee growth in the church and those within it. Teachers instruct mostly mostly away from the pulpit to give those under their tutelage in the church a more personal touch. These, in a more modern context, we'd probably see this as like small group leaders or something like that. Not to say that every small group leader has the gift of teaching, but like just to give a frame of reference to everyone. And pastors, probably the easiest ones here, they are those who speak on the word and lead the church gifted to them by God so that his people can learn more about him. Likewise, those who speak words of knowledge are also sometimes lumped in here, like I said before, because it fits within the parameters of, of the th other three words. Like it's kind of, it's a weirder gift. I'll put it that way of having access to knowledge that 
might have been something you know. And sometimes it's people would say it's something you've never known before, and God suddenly gives you with that idea, and you can then use that to teach someone so that the knowledge can spread. There's a lot of debate there. As you'll find, there's a lot of debate on pretty much all of these. <laughs> I mean, the spiritual gifts are something hotly contested within many different denominations of the church. So what does this all mean? Every single one of these has a place in the church, serving in these various roles. And like, yeah, sure, they can get lumped together into just being one gift by some people. But, you know, as with many gifts, it, it, there's a little bit of them being multifaceted to where uh, we want to simplify things and say, oh, this is all the same thing because my brain can handle that a little easier. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But at the same time, we should be careful about saying, well, this sounds similar to this, therefore sh they should be together. There's some argument about the, you know, the Greek words that Paul uses there. I think uh, for some of these, it's like, this is the only time he uses it. So who knows? But I mean, just for frame of reference though, Teaching is one of my spiritual gifts. I've always enjoyed teaching others and helping them to learn things, even outside of a spiritual context. Like if I can have someone learn a fact that I've known for all these years and they go, man, that's amazing. Like, or I go and like help someone say, this is what the Bible actually says about this. And you see that flicker of knowledge being transferred in their head and them going, oh, I get it now. Like, Nothing else really brings me more pleasure in this world than seeing that spark ignited in someone's eyes. And that's why, I mean, obviously it's my spiritual gift, so I feel so, so much about it. But it's just one of those things. That there's a joy that I can't understand that I don't get from some of these other things. Not to say I don't get joy from acts of service. I don't get joy from being charitable. Like, no, I do. But it's not in the same way. It's like he spiritually wired me in a way that says this right here. You're going to be good at it and you're going to get something out of it that other people can't in the same way. And that's true of you, too. Whatever your gift is. Next up, we have service. And this is probably one of the broadest gifts available. And because there's so many ways it can be interpreted, so many ways it could be performed. Like it could just involve cleaning the church. It could be reaching out to a family in need, or there are plenty of other ways to denote one seeking to solve the many issues that exist not only within the church, but in the world around them. And service is one of those things I'm not good at. <laughs> I mean, you know, cards on the table there. It's not that I'm incapable of it. It's just not something that is always readily available in my head. You should do this for someone. Or if it does, it's like, oh, someone else will do it. So I am very appreciative of people who do because it's a lot of good work sometimes. And we'll get to another one that doesn't get the credit it deserves later on. Next up is exhorting, exhortation. Uh, these blessed people are those who are out there constantly on the front lines of the spiritual warfare and the people around them also in their prayer closets, seeking to encourage the people of God and to lift up their worries to him. These two, exhortation and service, are kind of the unsung heroes of the church. Uh, not to say the others there aren't unsung heroes there too, but like in my mind, when I think of gifts, these aren't the first two to come to mind. And they're so important to have people willing to get on their knees, praying for others, willing to go out there and see what they need. And they should be credited for their faithfulness just as much as their peers. That's one of the points Paul brings up here. It's like, it doesn't matter which one you have. What matters is what you're doing with it, because that brings glory to God. Next up, words of wisdom. <laughs> now, this is another one I could have brought to teaching, preaching, but that it is often seen as its own thing. It seems to be an ability. There's not a lot of expositing done in Scripture on this idea for the spiritual gift. It, it seems to offer the user the power to discern the right things to say at the appropriate moment in time. And there's actually a lot of debate on this one, too, in the fact that there are some who think that this is a gift that all Christians are able to utilize at some point in time in their walks. And it's not just one specifically devoted to one person to have. 
Now, I kind of like that idea a lot because there have been plenty of times when I have said something that's like, oh, yeah, that didn't come from me. Or maybe it did and I just repressed it. Or maybe it did and I just thought I couldn't make that word come out, uh, those words come out the same way I wanted to, but they did. And I just have low expectations of myself. But I'm going to say I kind of favor the idea ultimately that this is something that everyone has, but I can't prove it either. So th this ambiguity is killing me. And if it's killing you as well, like, hey, you're in good company. But that's one of the things is just it's kind of almost unknowable to an extent how deeply these gifts affect the world and the people who can utilize them and the people who can't or maybe everyone can. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but we're working on it. Next up, we have mercy. And this is the ability to see the totality or the closeness thereof to another's true self and then offering them kindness and understanding, as well as reaching out to offer aid to those who least deserve it just as much as those who do. Sometimes you'll see people merge this one with the gift of service. But I see them as very different approaches to the same problem. And I get to say that because mercy is my second spiritual gift. Now, there's some people out there that say, really? So, yes. Number one, my siblings are still alive. <laughs> but, but no, it's, it's one that infuriates me that this is one of mine because it's so antithetical to who I am without Jesus that I've had to learn along the way that I'm actually really gifted at this. I just, in my darkest heart, sometimes don't want to offer it. But he has taught me along the way. It's like, look, those people that did something bad to you and you said, hey, it's okay. I forgive you. Like it was nothing to say that. That's just not you being passive. That's not just not you, you know, trying to bring peace. That's actually you. You mean those words. Because you know how bad it is to be on the other side of things, and you want to offer them mercy. And this is a gift. Christians are expected to bring mercy to everyone. Some people are better at it. And that has been something I have had to learn along the way, is that I am better at it in that sense of listening, of that sense of giving them the time. There is someone around them who is working to understand them as best as possible to help them out in their situation and to forgive them when the time comes. But that's me. We're still figuring out where you're at too. Maybe you figured it out by now. That'd be great. I'll work on it. This is, this is awesome. Next up, we have giving. Now, once again, this is another one we're all called to give as part of faithful service to Christ. You know, however much, some people, how much you want to give. Some people say 10%. Some people say more than that. Some people say whatever God says to give. I'm whatever God says to give to you in that specific moment in time. But those with this spiritual gift offer far more than their fellows, both financially and of themselves. It is a tremendously wonderful thing to be in a position where giving without worrying about what happens to the money afterward is a place where a believer can be. Sometimes we can get a little too cynical for our own good, saying, oh, is this really going overseas to missionaries? Or is this really going to help repair the church or the, you know, to help that food drive out like I think it's supposed to be? For people with the gift of, of giving, most of the time, in my experience with them, They've never once thought about that. Or if they have, they keep it to themselves. And that's a great place to be in. To trust God that, that fully and to go, this is yours already. Here's what I'm giving back. Next up, we have administration and uh, kind of pseudo leading as well as one of the words brought up here. And this is the ability to organize and gather resources to help maintain the church from within. This is another one I find myself very jealous of at times, because like I mentioned earlier, I couldn't be further away from having this if I tried. I am not an organizer outside of writing a book and plotting things out, knowing where the characters are going. You look at my room right now, you go, well, yeah, you definitely don't have this gift. I don't want to be the one in charge of you no know, program 
or a focus group or what have you, because that responsibility kind of gets at me. So I would rather be, if I had to be involved with that, one of the grunts getting stuff done than ever being in charge. Because that's a lot of work. That's a lot of responsibility. And that is just not for me. But to those who are great at it, we desperately need them. And that's one reason to find myself jealous of them is that they are able to budget well, to handle finances well, their time and control that aspect of their lives to where they can get their work done, see their family, have fun. And it doesn't feel like it's any great pressure for them to do it. And anything else that comes that could cause problems without direct oversight handling them is something most of them are adept at doing well. That is not me. But that's okay. Because someone else in the church should be doing that. And we should be grateful for the hard work they put into it. Next up, we have miracles. Now, this is the ability to supernaturally engage with the power of God to rewrite the natural laws of science, nature, and logic to create something impossible by human means, such as parting the Red Sea or calling down fire from heaven. Those two things happen in Scripture. I'm not capable of doing that that I am aware of. I cannot re reproduce that idea scientifically especially at the time these things were happening. Nature doesn't work that way. Logic says that's impossible. But God defies our human wisdom. And he allows people to have the ability to perform miracles. And if there's anything on this list besides maybe tongues that people think doesn't happen anymore, then it's this one. Our, our cessationists, like this is kind of probably their, uh, their personal bugbear. It's like, nope, this definitely doesn't happen anymore. And I'm astounded because I see, I see miracles far too often to ever say, no, this is impossible. I've seen people, doctors, uh, the head neuroscientist of the Southern, uh, Southeastern United States saying, this woman's going to die. And a bunch of people praying around her, God intervening. And her living, not only that, but having a child, both of whom shouldn't have survived this experience. I've seen, I mean, friendships be restored. And it sounds like so small, but like, think of the miraculous ways these things happen, that God is able to do them. Now, once again, we're talking about people doing this versus God. Sure. But at the end of the day, these things are possible. And I think if we shut our minds off to that, it's because... I, I don't really know. It's kind of infuriating to think, oh, well, God just suddenly stopped. And he doesn't, it's not, uh, I, I would argue the cessationists probably wouldn't say God doesn't care. And if they do, they're wacko, even for a wacko idea, in my opinion. But that's not who God is. God is still intervening. God is still bringing people to him. And every single time it's a miracle. And you say, oh, your miracle definition is too broad. Sure, I'll, I'll grant you that in that regard. But there's still miraculous things happening out, uh, out there. There are people being hidden from their pursuers when they should be looking right at them. There are people out there who are exercising demons because they're out there. And that's a miracle. This thing is still happening. We just need to be more aware of beyond our little Western ideas of how the world works. Next up, faith. Now, that sounds simple, but this is faith beyond the normal amount expected of Christians. We are all called to be faithful. We are all called to have faith. But instead, these people who have this gift have the ability to call out to God for the impossible to be done in that moment potentially even causing mountains to crumble or move. And in my opinion, this is one of the least understood gifts and one of the hardest to independently verify, but it is a gift nonetheless. And there are people who possess it. You know how I know that? God said so in scripture. Easy as pie. Next up, healing. 
is the power to supernaturally remove diseases, maladies, and afflictions from the body without the aid of medicine. This one, too, is often believed to be lost to us, but I continue to disagree with that notion that we simply that simply because we don't often see it in action doesn't mean it's gone forever. There are people out there living in this world that have been touched by another who had this gift and their malady was taken away from them. To this day, I can say that with full faith. Next up, we have discerning between spirits. Uh, this is the ability to tell whether or not a word spoken by a spirit was either divinely offered or demonic in origin. And like others, this is going to be harder to verify. Uh, but some think this is another gift all Christians have that simply activates when the time is right. It's kind of like a sleeper agent. It's like you hear a specific phrase, oh, you're activated, and now you're getting the work done. Now, uh, I think if this is a gift, I, I do kind of lean towards the idea of us all having it, but like some people will never use it once. Some people will use it maybe once or twice. Some people use it way more, like depending on how things go. And this is different from uh, interpreting tongues. We'll get to that in a second. That's a wholly separate issue. Next up on the docket, we have evangelists. Now this one too, before I get into the definition, some people don't think this is a spiritual gift, but because I do see it listed uh, among the other gifts in Ephesians, I'm going to say it is. And I do have a professor who taught me uh, for my evangelism class who kind of disregards this idea, too. So uh, they're very and he's way smarter than me when it comes to this. That's definitely something he's very gifted at, even if it's not a spiritual gift. So your mileage may vary on this one. Now, evangelism is the ability to reach out to others who do not know Christ and have them realize their need for him so that they can repent of their sins and be one with him. Now, like several others on this list, every Christian is called to evangelize yet the Great Commission alone. That's all we need. Jesus said, go out and make disciples all across the world. But not all are called to do it as readily as those with the gift of evangelism. This means they're going to be spending more time out there. These could easily be missionaries. They could easily just be someone who invites people into their homes and has a Bible study with them, that knowing their neighbors don't know Jesus. Could be both. I do know this is definitely another one of those that I'm not particularly well gifted in. Not that I can't do it, but it's not something that I, I'm not the person you want to call up on the front lines first. So that's another thing I figured out. Oh, I'm not good at this. And that's okay. That doesn't mean I give up on it and say, oh, well, I never have to evangelize again because that's not my spiritual gift. It means no. There are people more able than myself to do this. So I should go to them if I'm having an issue where I am falling short in my attempts to evangelize. And here we go. Final two, save the best for last question mark, we have tongues and the ability to interpret tongues. Let's start with tongues first. This is the power to speak in a language unknown to its speaker, wherein they deliver a word from God to the people in the church as to what he desires from them in a way separate from prophecy, as it concerns itself not so much with future events, but more to the current situation more often than not. And there are many who would say that this no longer exists, and there are many who would say it definitely does. Tongues as a whole is a very divisive part of the church today, and it's difficult to figure out whether it is present anymore. Uh, like many on this list, like pretty much mo all of them, I, yeah, uh, I think it is. But no one near as prevalent as some would say mostly because of our next and final spiritual gift, which is required in order for the gift of tongues to be verified. Tongues is such an amazing gift. We see it in Acts at Pentecost. Peter being able to speak, he's speaking one thing, but everyone's hearing it differently. That's amazing. Like people from all over the, the Roman world and beyond heard the gospel presented to them as one person was speaking 
you would think in Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, but they heard it in different languages. There was someone around to interpret it. I think the same thing could easily happen today if God so chooses. But let's get to the qualifications of how it can happen with our final gift, and that is the interpretation of tongues. This is the ability to hear one who speaks in a language unknown to the listener, who finds themselves able to interpret and speak to the people on what the person speaking in tongues is saying, so it can be understood in their own language. Without this gift in action, tongues is worthless. It must also be understood by someone, otherwise it becomes mindless babbling, and it has no use in the church. Simply marking those who use it in this way without interpretation to sound like a bunch of lunatics rather than devoted followers of God. I know that's kind of contentious, but it's true. It has no place in the church if no one can understand it. At, at best, in my opinion, it's someone trying to look like they're being holy by having it happen to them. And once again, I'm not saying it never happens. I'm saying if it does, there are requirements around for it to be true. It should never bring glory to the person who speaks. It should always point back to God who delivers the message to the person who needs to speak tongues for that specific purpose that God has in mind for it. Now, I know that was a lot. This is going to be a long episode. All this to say, spiritual gifts exist. You have at least one, probably two at the max. And there may be some that we all share. They are worthy of being studied and worthy of figuring out which ones you possess because God has offered to you and I not only for our good, but for the good of others, these gifts. And now we can get back to the rest of Romans 12. <laughs> we'll be in verses 9 to 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Before we get to our bullet points here, love is always genuine. Love cannot be faked, presented as a lie, or offered at the detriment of another. God is love, and his people must love as he loves. And in order to do that, Paul gives some excellent examples of how to love in this passage. Let's start with the first. Abhor evil. That means get rid of it. Hate it. Want it. No place next to you. Evil has no place in the heart of the Christian's heart. Excuse me. It, it <laughs> has no place in the Christian's heart or their church. If it exists there, it must be eliminated for the good of all. By its very nature, evil and sin corrupt. They have no place around the faithful. And that is not to the point of, oh, this person is evil, therefore I can't talk to them. They're living in sin. No, that's not what it's saying. What this is saying is it can't be making decisions in the church. It can't be lingering around there and saying, oh, well, they're getting away with it, so maybe I can do the same with my own personal sin. No, it needs to be removed for the good of everyone around you. Not in a witch hunt case. Not in a, okay, everyone. Line up at the church and everyone say your sins in front of the pastor and in front of everyone else. Like, no, it needs to be removed not only by you, but the people around you who are working to your benefit and theirs because sin cannot abide in the presence of God. It should not be among his people either. Next up, brotherly affection. Love each other as family. Simple enough, right? Wrong. Families by their very nature as being built around human beings who are screwed up, are screwed up. But good families work together to uplift one another. The church should do the same. My family is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But we do look out for each other. 
We do pray for one another. We do listen to one another. The church should do that and more. And then we have uh, outdoing each other in honor. This is not one-upsmanship. This is the genuine desire to do good in the world because you see your brothers and sisters doing good. If I see my sister in Christ doing good, that should motivate me not to say, well, I'm going to do better than her, but to say, I should be doing good too, because good feels good. It's that simple. We should be doing good because we want there to be more good in the world. So outdo each other in honor, not to place yourself on a pedestal, not to have rankings come out and say, well, uh, well, Bill here led 75 people to Christ last month and uh, gave away his money to the poor. And, oh, seems to me like you talked to that one coworker who was feeling down. Mm. Ah, just, just not comparable. Uh, Bill's a little higher than you. Like, no, that's not how this works. Outdo each other in honor for his glory, not ours. Then we have active zeal, being fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. Hiding our zeal for God out of laziness is evil. And I am saying this to myself foremost before I say it to you. I am very guilty of this. And it is something that I'm currently working on. Because I get too lazy for my own good and I deny the fellowship. Or if there are circumstances beyond my control where I can't be in the fellowship, I get angry because I can't fellowship with them because I'm sick or, you know, because I had to work for someone else during the weekend. So I can't go to church or I can't meet with other people during the week like I would for outside of class. And then I allow that mindset to say, oh, uh, well, I missed church last week, so I don't have to go now. Or I don't display God's love in my life because I'm not around people who are doing it. Because I'm removing myself away from them so I can do whatever I want. Don't fall into this trap. It can only harm you. Next, we have rejoice and hope. Guys, we have something to hope in. Act like it. You know why some people don't go to church? Because the Christians inside look like they're dead. Look like they have to do this out of obligation or because... Their parents are still alive and they don't want to get written out of the will or what have you. That is a terrible image we are offering to the world. We should be happier and more joyous than anyone else in the world because we know what we've been saved from. Act like it. Patience. Whew. Mm -mm. Don't like this one. <laughs> Patience and tribulation. Uh, suffering isn't fun. Now, I know that's blowing your minds right now, but suffering isn't fun. But we need to know that there will always be a light at the end of the tunnel one day, and our patient endurance is worth maintaining. Not because we're waiting for the benefits of being patient, but because we know there's something more than what we are currently going through and that God is still with us even in the midst of that tribulation. Which brings us to constant prayer. And that is we need to continually seek God in prayer faithfully, not only for ourselves, but for others. Here's another one. Cards on the table. I'm really bad at. Like, tremendously so. I wish I could say that I'm just being willfully disobedient, but it's mostly because I just forget to do it. And in my opinion, that makes it worse. Because, you know, there's one thing is like, oh, I'm choosing not to. And another is like, I just don't remember to do it. Like, one is willful. The other is because my, my memory sucks. Like, at least pick a side there, buddy. Or write it down. Or even if I do, I misplace it. It's not fun. I don't like it because I do need to be in prayer more often than I am. Because it serves a very useful function to give me time with him, to give you time with him. And to also have our minds look beyond ourselves to look for the needs of others and bring them up to God. Not because he doesn't know they're happening, but because he wants to talk with us. He wants to experience time with us. This is a relationship. Our religion is a relationship between us and God. And if we are denying this, it's only coming one way from him. That's not much of a relationship. Final, uh, final part of this round, we have contribute and be hospitable. 
And this is something we do to the best of our abilities. We need to help within the church and to open our homes to those who need help. As we can. Not everyone has money. Not everyone has a house. You may have just have an apartment. That doesn't mean you can't have people over. It doesn't mean you can't have a meal with them. It means it has to be done in a different way than it can to someone who has a house or to someone who has a mansion. Or just host people at the church. Ask for, for, for permission. And if you clean up after yourselves, they'll let you do it again. More than likely, find a way to do it to where you can contribute and be hospitable. In 14 through 21, and we will be done. And as time goes on here, I'd go, yep, I made the right choice in splitting this off and not doing two in a row. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, uh, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now let's go through our bullet points here. Blessing our persecutors. It's what everyone wants to hear, right? Oh, I just can't wait to bless the people that are that are hating me and hating God. It's just, oh, I just wake up every morning and I want to do that. They know. And I know the people are less misanthropic than I am, but this is one I struggle with too. Even, even with the point of one of my gifts being mercy, it's something I had to learn over time. It's like, no, it is not acceptable for me to deny someone mercy simply because they're affecting me. It's a lot easier to forgive someone if they're affecting someone else sometimes. And also along the way, it's kind of gone that weird twist of, I've actually kind of stopped caring if someone hurts me and I get offended when they hurt someone else. So it's harder to forgive them and show mercy. It's, it's weird how that changes in people's minds as time goes on. And even, like I said, with my, one of my spiritual gifts being mercy, I've had to learn how to do that more effectively. So it's something we all need to do. It is hard to do this and not curse those who, uh, curse those who despise us, but we're called to do it anyways. Because guess what? Those very same people who curse us and curse Jesus need him just as much as we do. And we should be an example to them so that they can have the joy that can only come from knowing him. If I lash out at them, I'm confirming what they probably already think and that the world is made of miserable people and Jesus isn't real because the Christian's acting like that. We need to be better. Rejoice and weep. This one's a cute call out too. Be able to move your mind as needed from joy to comfort as the situation calls for. People who are upset often don't need you to bring them to a party or make them the center of attention. Likewise, people who are rejoicing often don't need to be reminded of how terrible and sin-filled the world is. There are ways to approach these things those often aren't the best way to do it. As someone who's had to learn a lot about how to respond to the emotional needs of others, I'm telling this to you just as much as I am to me, that just because you feel one way, it doesn't mean you should force the other person to feel the same simply for your benefit. Oh, you're crying. You're upset. I don't like that. Let me make you feel better, not because I care about you, but because I want you to stop. That is an evil way of thinking. It doesn't benefits no one. Because you're seeking to stop evil with evil. But one thing we need to learn is you need to be as kind or as tough as needed to the situation. Sometimes people need you to sound like, like you're angry. To get them to shape up. Other times, people need you to be soft and gentle. 
learn how to do both because both have their place in correction and loving. Next up, we have harmony, pride, and wisdom. Uh, living with others requires work. And if we want to live in harmony with people around us, it requires that we do not set others above the lowly or to make ourselves higher than them. Likewise, we need to stop depending on our own wisdom, but God's instead. If we do those things, it is a lot easier to live in harmony with people. That doesn't mean it doesn't guarantee that the people around us will respond positively, but it does guarantee that we are doing our part. And after that, it's not our fault if someone still wants to live in discord and hate because we've done our job. Next up, evil for evil. Evil by its very nature can never breed good from acting in an evil manner. This is not, I am doing this evil thing for the good of all. It's like, no, more than likely you're doing that evil thing because it benefits you. And that's how you're twisting things, Christian, to make things sound better. It's like, oh, that's just why I did it. I had to act like that. I had to be, you know, send a little, you know, tough to them that day. Instead of like actually looking out for the welfare it's like, no, it's just to get in the shape up. Like, or I, I had to steal this, or I, I had to, you know, uh, talk about my achievements because well, it brought them lowly and they need a, they need a kick in the pants. You can't be so prideful there. It's like, no, we can't do this because it is evil. Revenge, as we'll get into in a second, is God's to offer, not ours. Just simply because someone has hurt me doesn't mean I then directly get to go and do the same to them. What this also doesn't mean is that we don't just let evil exist around us and be passive and say, oh, well, revenge is God's. Uh, God will avenge me and then do nothing about the evil around us. No. What it does mean, though, is we don't stoop down to their level and repay evil with evil. Living peace, uh, peacefully. Ah, peaceably. Paul gives us this point with the idea that this isn't always possible, but we are still called to do it, even with such a difficult task ahead of us. Like he even says, if possible, live peaceably. He knows how difficult it is. You want to talk about man, led a very uh, contentious life with a lot of people who hated his guts. Well, look no further than Paul. And he did his best to live peaceably. It's not like he said, all right, it's time to start a riot today and, you know, get the, you know, Temple of Artemis upset about, you know, the money being taken away from him. It's like, no, he was trying to do good in the world, bringing people to Christ, and bad things happen as a result of it. So do your best to live peaceably. Also recognize you don't live in a peaceable world. So be prepared. Now, revenge. I stopped uh, short earlier from going into this because it was brought up again. We are not called to revenge ourselves on others. Once again, this doesn't mean that we don't pretend it didn't happen. That we just go, oh, well, God will avenge me. Like, guess what? He will. He could very well use you to do that. But this is something that you've got to be careful about doing to make sure, what is my motivation for gaining justice here? Is it for my personal honor? Is it to get a leg up on this person who hurt me? Is it to take something from them? Or is it to stop them from doing it to someone else so that they don't have to be hurt? Or is it done in a way to prevent evil from spreading further because, oh, you've just been aware of a problem that you didn't know existed until now. Well, guess what? God can easily use you to bring justice. But you've got to be very careful. This is a very slippery slope to travel on if you're not prepared mentally for the task of God using you for the avenging. You know, we can't all be a member of the Avengers, as fun as that would be sometimes. But when we are called to avenge by God, we better be able to discern whether or not that's him saying that or us. Next up, we have treat enemies with love 
and then overcome. This is the turn the other cheek teaching, just worded in a different way. We need to treat our enemies with love, not simply go, okay, you've wronged me. Now it's time for the sword. Now it's time for the gun. Or now it's time for me to ruin you financially. It's like, no. There's a way to love them, to be hospitable to them, especially because they don't deserve it. Not to put yourself in danger to say, oh, well, uh, this man killed my entire family. I'm going to invite him over for dinner uh, because he's on the run. Like, no, that, that's being stupid. Think these things through. Be reasonable. Live peaceably. That's not a good way to live peaceably or harmoniously. And these burning coals that are mentioned here that Paul uh, quotes from the verse in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 25, they have a dual meaning. They can either refer to the anguish that an evil person feels when good is done to them by their enemy, or more often in the Old Testament, this is used as a illustration of the righteous judgment that comes to them when God has stopped his wrath, uh, excuse me, has allowed his wrath to reach them. Either way, we need to show his love to them so that if he chooses to display his wrath, they have no one to blame but themselves because the truth was presented to them and they denied it. That's not why we do it. We don't go in hoping, man, I hope they fail. I hope they don't get the lesson God is trying to teach them right now. It's like, no, our goal is to let them know what the evil that they're doing and the harm that they're doing to others and to see who God is so that they can turn away from that sin in the same way we were turned away to look at him instead of who we used to be. And that's it for Romans 12. So thank you for this hour-long episode. Wasn't expecting to be that long, but here we are. I should know better when I see how big my notes are. Uh, thank you all for listening. If you please just leave a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice just to help us out with the ratings there. If you're interested in my fiction writing, you can find my works at StarfingWritersGuild.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then go ahead and check out the other members of the Anazal Ministries Podcasting Network. You can contact me at LetNothingMoveYouPodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Joshua Knoll for the editing that he does and for the music that he provides to the podcast. And with all that in mind, uh, God bless you all in accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you. <laughs>